I mean, first of all, I'm truly honored to be receiving this award. It, it, it means a lot to me, number one. Number two, how many people have traveled from different parts of the country just to come here um, to either hear this or to stand outside or to meet me at a pub or whatever the deal might be? Uh, it means a lot to me. Obviously, many of you that are hardcore fans remember how this got started. This was just, you know, I, I've been a fight guy since I was a little kid. I've been into boxing, martial arts, you name it. And uh, I had this idea and this vision that this sport could be one of the biggest sports in the world. And as we continue to travel around the country and put on, around the world and put on fights, um, there's nothing cooler. I was talking to these guys at, at lunch. There's nothing cooler than a UFC fan. It doesn't matter where you're from or uh, what language you speak or what color you are, it doesn't matter. You know, some of the coolest people you'll ever meet. And uh, you guys are a testament to that here today. Coming out and traveling and just, just to be here for this award or whatever you want to call it or just to do this Q&A with me, I'm truly honored and I appreciate it. Thank you. So before we get started, um, everyone will have a chance in the audience to ask a question. Um, but I guess I'll just get the, the ball rolling. Um, Dana, the UFC clearly has huge international appeal. Like from having 65 million people, you know, watch your events in Brazil to like massive success that you have in America and like growing throughout the world. Uh, what is it you think about the sport that gives us that, that sort of massive appeal? I believe you know the philosophy in building this business has always been. Over the last 13 years, I can throw all kinds of stats and figures at you about how popular this is, how many people watch it, Brazil and the rest of the world. Here's something I don't know if it's true, but what I always believed, and oddly enough, this is how the company was built. Before a guy kicked a ball into a net, before a guy hit a ball with a stick, two men were put on this earth, somebody threw a punch, and whoever was standing around ran over and watched. I believe that fighting is the first sport on earth, and like I said, it crosses all cultural language barriers because it doesn't matter what color you are, what language you speak, or what country you're from, we're all human beings. Fighting's in our DNA, man. We get it and we like it. And it always made sense to me. Thanks, I understand. Um, so the next question I was going to ask, um, so your next pay-per-view will feature women fighting in the UFC for the first time ever. Uh, how do you see women's role as fighters, like, as professional fighters in the UFC? I wasn't a big fan in the beginning. You know, this sport has gone, overgone this evolution over the last 20 years, not just the 13 years that we've owned it. But, uh, you know, when you see some of these women now, you know, there's women who compete in Olympic wrestling, Olympic judo, and many other martial arts. There's women out there now that are, you know, I, I keep using Ronda Rousey as the, as the big example. Um, you know, th this girl's been training since she was six years old in judo. She won a world medal, a, a gold, a bronze medal in the Olympics, and now she's 9-0, and, oh, and she, all of her fights, all nine of her fights, have lasted a total of nine minutes and 25 seconds. She can beat guys too. She's tough enough to take guys. Uh, she's tough enough to be in the UFC. So it was time to uh, for me to admit that. And here we are. Is there anybody in the audience who that like like to ask questions at this point? Yep. Uh, Dana, given that you know a lot of guys are coming to UFC from wrestling, what, how, do you, how do you feel about wrestling getting to go to the Olympics today? We actually had a long discussion uh, about that today at lunch. It's uh, you know. It's not good. It's a bad thing. But uh, we were talking about the possibility of because now wrestling not being an Olympic sport, maybe they should start looking at mixed martial arts, which incorporates wrestling. Because no, no matter what, when you look at uh, whether it's the Olympics or whether it's college wrestling, high school wrestling, whatever it is, the key is to sell tickets and to have people interested. You want spectators. You want, uh, you want people to want to compete in it and you want people to go watch people compete in it. Well, there's no doubt that no matter where we go in the world, people want to see people compete, compete in mixed martial arts. So may, maybe it's part of the evolution of us getting into the Olympics. Thanks. Anybody else like to ask a question? Yeah. Hi, Dan. How's it going? I'm sure you've got this question already today, but uh, when are you coming back to Ireland for uh, an event? Actually, we were just talking about that today, too. Uh, <laughs> what we're working on is, a, you know, we're, we're seven, eight years behind over here. And the reason is we haven't been able to secure the television deal that we need. Once we get the television deal here that we need, but my man right here who's going to make it all happen is working on events that will happen in London, Manchester, Dublin, 
Northern Ireland, where we do the same event at, at a venue every year. And I'm talking big events, the kind of events you guys want over here. But it's all about television, and that's what we're working on. Uh, just want to say fair play for Simon Conor McGregor and uh, what do you think about him and uh, when did you start seeing this well, what I, well, any of you that follow sport real closely, you know Joe Silva's our matchmaker and he is one of the most miserable, meanest, nastiest <laughs> dudes you've ever come across. And uh, the fact that he thinks he's good enough to be in the UFC is, is good enough for me. The, one of the interesting points that we were talking about, some of the kids that I met last night uh, were telling me that at the press conference, at UFC 93, I said, once we uh, do a live event here, there will be an explosion in Ireland, and people will start training, and, and, and more and more fans uh, will migrate to the UFC, and sure enough, here we are here, UFC 157, and we're signing an Irish kid to fight in the UFC. That's a pretty big deal. <clears throat> yeah. uh, Dana, um, the room was UFC 160 is going to be Kane versus Big for two, and Aubrey versus JDS. Is that true? What was that question? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear that one. <laughs> was it a tough one? Is that why everybody's laughing? Okay, so UFC 60 is going to be Kane versus... Kane versus Bigfoot. Oh, yeah, the, the Irish Big Mouse I met yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I asked them to keep a secret, and they started tweeting it the minute I said it. <laughs> the answer to that question is yes. That fight will be... Uh, it's going to be Cain Velasquez versus Bigfoot Silva and Junior Dos Santos versus Alistar Overeem. Yeah. GSP what? That fight? Mm. There isn't a fight on this planet that I want to make more than Johnny Bones Jones versus Anderson Silva and George St. Pierre versus Anderson Silva. I saw him job with Crane Pain. It was absolutely incredible TV to watch from the Ronda Rousey Crane Pain there. Yeah. Great, great show. And I got to be honest, I actually cried my eyes watching it. It was incredible. So if anyone hasn't seen it, you've got to check it out. You're talking about the. the Crane Pain for Ronda Rousey? Ronda, Ronda Rousey, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think that once this fight happens, you know, a lot of people are, are uh, you know, there's a lot of backlash about her, them being the main event. She's the champion. She deserves to be the main event. You know, a lot of backlash from Henderson. Henderson's not the champion. There's a lot of great fighters on that card. To say that the women, you know, who's a world champion and who has medaled in the Olympics doesn't deserve a top billing over a guy who isn't a champion, that's some 1920 shit right there. <laughs> Hiya, Dana. How's it going? Um, just a quick one. The, this season's um, Ultimate Fighter seems to, be, seems to be taking off and it seems to be started off really well. But I just wanted to know, how do you think it ranks with the earlier seasons? Like, you had a lot of great fighters come out of maybe season one, season two. How do you think it matches up? Yeah, the Ultimate Fighter is one of those, uh, is one of those programs where year to year, it's going to, you know, season to season, it's going to change. You got great coaches one season, you know. Yeah, I'll admit, I blew it with the uh, Roy Nelson and, uh, you know, that, that whole thing didn't work out too good. But, uh, you know, it's, it's going to vary season to season with the... Uh, with, with the talent. This season of The Ultimate Fighter, the coaches are phenomenal and the talent is unbelievable. So it's going to be a great season. Hopefully I can pull it off again next season. Uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, Dana. I don't mean to annoy you about Josh Barnett, but um, I was reading on the internet that he's uh, said no to the deal. Is that 100% that he won't be going to the UFC? You got an accent there, my man. <laughs> <laughs> I need a translator for that. <laughs> Josh Barnett, 100% not coming. What's that? Josh Barnett coming to the episode. Josh Barnett. We uh, we were talking to Josh Barnett, and uh, he uh, he got crazy on us here the last couple of weeks. And from what I understand, it's, it, the talks weren't going too well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, just with the international expansion, particularly across the Europe. I'm just wondering if she could ever see maybe kind of local belts, like maybe a European championship like in boxing within the UFC. How far away do you think we, we'd be from that? We've, talk, we've talked happen. about that. There definitely has to be, you know, much like the United States and the rest of the world, there's, there's uh, you know, fights happen every weekend all around the world, not just the UFC. And those, those smaller organizations are where this younger talent comes from. 
Um, but yeah, I could see a time where we're putting on fights over here, you know, throughout Europe that are uh, building contenders. Again, all about television. Let's go over here. Um, just ask, um, what's uh, next in line for Shogun? It's a good question. Uh, you know, there's a lot of options. We could do Shogun versus Rashad. Um, that talent at 205, it's deep, so there's a lot of fights we could do. We were talking about doing uh, him and Noguera. For some reason, those two, you know, they fought before in Pride, and there's some history with those two, and I guess they want to fight each other again. So that could happen. My man. Yeah. This is in relation to Mel Van and he, I was wondering if you recently with him that he was questioning about there's a picture of you and him together after UFC 156. Uh, him signing UFC, and he said he hadn't signed UFC, but he was given the opportunity to see if he would love you. And he was talking to different opponents like Bernard Silva and Mike Bisling and uh, Kumbi and Anderson Silva. So I'm just wondering if, if is now a man up like, in consideration to be signed, and if so, would you look at one of those fights? Well, he was just there, we were just hanging yeah. out, but you know, yeah. you, you gotta. Uh, He's got to win a big fight. He's got to win a big fight, but I know people love that guy because of his style of fighting, and I would never say never, but yeah, he, he's, he's a guy that we would absolutely look at. He's got to win a bigger fight, though, outside of the UFC. What do you think about his Mark Hunt fight, though? About who? His fight with Mark Hunt. Um, I'm more excited for Strew's fight with Mark Hunt. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, do you have any words with Rashad Evans after his last fall? <laughs> what, <do you> think? <laughs> okay, like what was the question? Who's last fight? Rashad. Oh, Rashad Evans? He looked terrible. Yeah, we talked. Uh, he did nothing. He literally stood there and went like this for uh, three rounds. And uh, he's completely depressed about it. And uh, Rashad Evans needs to get that fire back, man. He needs to, you know. <laughs> Guys made a lot of money. When you have a few million bucks in the bank, it's tough to get up and get punched in the face every day. <laughs> He's definitely suffering from that. When uh, Noguera got his arm popped, what did you feel with regards against Frank Murray? Because was it good publicity or bad publicity for the UFC? When, when Noguera's arm broke? Yeah. Well, the thing about jiu-jitsu is, and anybody who understands it, and people that don't, I could explain it. When you get in a position like that, you're able to tap out. You know what I mean? And uh, he definitely should have tapped out. <laughs> Bad idea. But did you get negative comments or negative reactions? No, that? no, we didn't get any. No, no backlash from that or nothing. Oh, man. What's the situation with Eddie Alvarez and how likely is he to be in the UFC by the end of the year? Ask me that again. Uh, what is the situation with signing Eddie Alvarez? Ah, uh, that's that's a good question. Obviously, I mean, if any, if you've read anything about what I've said about that. I feel like Eddie Alvarez is, uh, you know, he, first of all, he's in court right now, so the courts are going to have to decide how that plays out for him. But uh, it's, it's a bad deal. He should be able to, you know, his contract is up. Yeah, they have a right to match. I don't care what anybody thinks, and, you know, I know that you get a lot of UFC hate out there because we're the big, you know, the big dog. They couldn't match that offer in a million years, you know. Um, and, and the kids should be... When your contract's up, that's when you get to go out and find out exactly what you're worth. That's when, when a fighter or an athlete or whoever gets to find out what they're worth. Found out what he's worth. Yeah. Viacom has the money. Pay him. Pay the kid the money that he would have made in the UFC. Then there's nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. Then it's fair. And I just wanted to congratulate you on your first portrayal of a gay fighter in this game. I thought that was incredibly sensitively handled and very well portrayed. Thank you. And I'm very curious to know what you would suggest is the, the impasse with gay male fighters being portrayed. I, I, I would imagine it's coming from them. But the analogy I would draw is with the Premiership football players. Their personal managers and agents tell them not to come out because it's an added burden for them in their careers. <laughs> is that a factor, do you think, in why we don't have any out male gay fighters? I don't know. That's a good question. I think, you know, I think it's a personal choice. I think that there's a lot of, you know, I think there's a lot of gay actors, a lot of gay athletes that don't come out because they're worried about the repercussions of, of you know, what it would do to their career. Um, I actually applaud Liz, you know what I mean? Good for her. And, and, and none of that should matter. 
it, it doesn't matter to me. You know, I, contrary to popular belief, uh, you know, and, and the things that, that have happened in the past, I, I am the furthest thing from. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a gay rights advocate, but I'm also a fight fan and a former professional fighter. Um, if you were to suggest outside pressure from fans or from media that might facilitate the first coming out of a gay, gay male fighter, what would occur to you? If, if the first gay fighter came out... You, you, you referenced gay rights groups and about how they might get offended if somebody's called somebody a fag and right. some a fighter or something like that. Like, that's inevitable, I don't think. I think most mature <coughs> aren't going exactly. to put up in arms about that. But, that kind of stupid stuff's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's no different than being black or being, you know, there's, there's lots of things. People are going to say stupid stuff. It, I think it just depends on the individual and how you want to live your life. If it's even important that people know that about you. You know what I mean? It, it's the fact that there's a complete absence of gay sporting role models for young gay men. That's, right. that's why I think it's relevant. And I think that you sit at the cusp of a, a company and a moment in history when you can make a real difference. And I think you already have with, in, in terms of Miss Carmouche. Yeah. Uh, I think that your video production people are to be seriously commended for Thank how you. That, was, that was put forward. And um, I, would, I would really hope that it's not that far away from a moment similar. I, I mean, you have over 400 men under contract. There's undoubtedly some there who could be encouraged in that direction and there could be a boost for their career. Ask Ian McKellen, he says, compare my acting career before I came out to when I came out afterwards. The range of options available to me just exploded. So um, I'm wondering what I, as a, as a fight fan and as a gay activist, can do to facilitate that. It's a good question. Again, I, I just, I, I think it's personal choice. If somebody wants to come out, I don't care who comes out. You know, and, and people have asked me, well, what if somebody won't fight him? They'll fight him. <laughs> I mean, come I on. You, on that one. you know what I mean? It's, it's like, uh, it's, it's, it's 2013, man. It's, it's ridiculous. It, I mean, I'm still, I'm still blown away that a government can tell two people they don't love each other. You know? Listen, there's some people that, that, that don't like it and other people that don't. That doesn't affect your life one way or the other. It's personal choice. It's, it's somebody else's business, whether they want to come out or not come out. And when Liz, Liz came out, I, you know, good for her. I have no problem with that whatsoever. So, I mean, I, I could care less either way. It, it doesn't matter to me. I, I, and, and, and I can tell you, but if a guy came out, if a guy came out, yeah. we, we would promote him like we would promote anybody else, and I'd have no problem saying he was gay, a gay fight. I'm kind of trying to move you in the direction of encouraging any of you know that are, might be thinking of it to... to oh, I have. I said, come out. Yeah. It's not going to affect your career with... The UFC whatsoever, mm. not a, not a little bit. So where does the pressure need to be applied? What's that? Where where, where does the pressure need to be applied? No, no pressure. No, from from, from us, from fans, from media, from organizations, whatever. Again, I, I, again, I have to keep. It's I think it's personal okay. choice. That if somebody either wants to or doesn't want to come out, right. totally up to them. Okay. Thank you. And, uh, I'd like to first of all congratulate you for what you've done in the sport and international efforts. Thank you, sir. And um, just in regards to the bigger picture, um, how are the negotiations going with the New York Athletic Commission? And is it any truth to rumour that the 20th year anniversary will be held in Madison Square Garden? What was that question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah the 20 year anniversary is in November. And we, you know how hard we've been working on New York, and that's what we would love to do. I'd love to do a huge fight at the Garden, but uh, that culinary union in Las Vegas, the gangsters have been uh, making it tough. We'll see what happens. Hey, uh, thanks, Sam, for coming to Ireland and assist. Thank you. Uh, just two questions for you. Um, the first one, were you impressed with um, Ryan Couture's attitude after you told him that his dad put in the corner? Um, corner, uh, Ryan at the oh, Ryan Couture? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm not a big Randy Couture fan right now. <laughs> uh, and and the, way that I, the way that I look at it is, I had a man-to-man -man conversation with Ryan, and I asked him, I said, listen, this is my situation. I understand the situation you're in. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, we've come to a mutual agreement. Um, so we'll just see how this thing plays out. Um, the second question is, um, UFC is known as well for being a great uh, sports PR machine as well. Um, you released a site there, ufcsocial.com. 
I'm just wondering, as somebody who works in public relations and would love to work in UFC, what skills would I need to be accepted? <laughs> 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 To work for the UFC? Want to work for the UFC? Well, I can tell you this: as things start to uh, start to ramp up out here in Europe, and, and and all the work that Mr. Cook is doing, I'm sure that the, that he's going to be looking for some good men <clears throat> here very soon. So, what's the deal? What are you thinking about for uh, future employment here in, 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 the, in the UK and Ireland? I don't have the medal. You've got the medal. This is your audience. How do you like that? But, but seriously, I mean, uh, how, how big are you thinking this office is going to get in, in, in the UK? Well, you know, we, we've talked about it a lot. We, we haven't even started in places like Russia, Poland, Croatia. Uh, so that's a whole market. South Africa is part of our market. So we've really been focused on mainland Europe and the UK. So as that grows, I could see us at least doubling the number of people that are in our office right now. So we, we could have a 30-man 30, 30 office in our organization. Keep your eye on him. <laughs> Same with you. Sweet. In the history of the UFC, what's been your favorite fight? My favorite what? Fight. My favorite fight? Yeah. God, you know, if you, when people would ask me that question six years ago, I could crack it right off. We've had so many awesome fights over the last, but one of the, one of the craziest fights I've ever seen was Dan Henderson and Shogun. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Danny, yeah, yes, thank you. Um, in regards to social media, I only took a project last year where it stated how Dana White built UFC Empire using social media and using Facebook to promote fights, Twitter for yourself, and then also um, YouTube as well, for the blogs and uh, paper to promotion. What's your opinion on that? What's my opinion on social media? And how you built the uh, UFC using it. I, just, I, I love it. I just think it's the most powerful tool in the world as far as marketing goes. It costs you nothing. And what I love is the, is the direct relationship I have with the fans. Um, I've had lots of trouble with the media in the past. Um, they don't always write the right stories. They don't say it the way that it's supposed to be said. So then go through, rather than go through a middleman, I can talk directly to the fans. And stuff like this, I mean, what's happening right here in this room right now, um, this was all done through social media. The guys that I met last night when I was out, I met through social media. It's just a, it's a, it's an awesome way to, to, to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the people. And, and not only this stuff, but the night of an event, I'm on Twitter all night and I can see when problems are happening with my show that I wouldn't have known until Monday. And I can fix them right there on the spot that night so everybody has a good experience. Those are, you know, just a few of the things that I love about social media. Uh, since you incorporated the lot of ways into the UFC, which division do you think What are you asking me about the lighter weights? Are they? Which uh, division do you think is the most competitive? God, I mean, a lot of people were giving a lot of flack about that, you know, the, the, the 125 pound division, but if you look at that last fight between Dodds and Mighty Mouse, the fight was awesome. I mean, it was, it was such a great fight. Um, it just seems like, you know, our fans are, are so hypercritical about everything that's, that's new and that we're trying, that's done. But, uh, I would have to say, well, now with this move, I love this move of Pettis going down to 45. I mean, that fight's going to be sick. Pettis versus Jose Aldo? Are you kidding me? We were talking about that last night, too. Um, I think you're going to see a lot more competitive fights. And as we open up these places like Mexico and South America and Asia, you're going to see a lot of lighter, talented guys coming over. Guys like the zombie, you know what I mean? There's a lot of um, really successful Irish fighters uh, fighting at big European promotions in the lighter weight divisions, as we were mentioning. Uh, Floyd Connor and there's a few others at the moment. Are you actively looking to uh, scout them and possibly bring them into the UFC? And if there's anything in the Irish diaspora abroad, is there anything you can prepare for that? Absolutely. Like I was saying earlier, how big it is for us to have been here for UFC 93 and now there's an Irish fighter fighting in the UFC, you know? Especially when you talk about what a small country this is and how few people there are. To make it to the UFC, it's like a guy from Ireland making it to the NFL. Is there anybody in particular you're looking at? Maybe on the Patriots cards or any of the local guys in Dublin that you've uh, seen in Ireland? Organizing smaller cards or going to 
to look at smaller cars. Right. Have, you, have you noticed any noise? I haven't. That, I, I got so much stuff that I do now. <coughs> Joe Silva and Sean Shelby, that's what they do. They, 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 they're all over that. But yeah, the answer to your question is yes, it's just not me. Um, they're a work in progress, <laughs> you know, uh, they're voted on by the media, and, uh, you know, it's not going to be perfect, rankings never are, but, um, we were talking about this today, too, also, you know, the whole world, especially the sporting world, and in the United States, everybody looks at who's number one, two, three, four, so rankings, rankings are going to help us grow, uh, in the mainstream. Hey, Dana, I heard you, uh, heard you UFC were in negotiations with Fedor as recently as like six months ago. Uh, why was the deal that Tosk was going through at that time that it was a few years prior? Why didn't we do the deal? We tried to do the deal before that, but those crazy Russians wouldn't come to a deal with us. <laughs> we, uh, I mean, I did everything I could. I flew to some island out in the middle of nowhere and met them. We did a lot of crazy stuff to try to make that deal happen and just couldn't get it done. And what you, know, that, I, you know, I call his manager the dummy. His name is Vadim. The dummy played his cards right to the end and, and, and denied Fedor a, a shot in the UFC. The fans, the ability to see him fight in the UFC and, you know, him to make a bunch of money. It's, it's called, you know, when, 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 you, when you do business, everybody pushes hard and everybody plays hardball, but there, there has to be a point where you want to come to a deal. The dummy drove that thing all the way to the point where no deal could be made and everybody lost. But is it true that six months ago there was still Lesnar in favor of the fight? Is what? Is it true that six months ago, last summer, there was talk of uh, Lesnar in favor? That is true. We were very close. Lorenzo was working on it hard and we were real close and then Fedor's dad died. And when his dad died, he was just like, you know what, I'm done. I want to be with my family and I want to, you know, I, I fought my fights and Tired. And then when Brock heard that, Brock retired too. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, Dan. Um, do you think it's time to send Chael Sullivan to North Korea to sort shit out? <laughs> <laughs> Again, we're in one of those positions where, you know, this is the biggest show in the world. We're trying to work with her. We're trying to uh, figure out how she could come here and fight in the UFC. You know, when, when you start sending, when you have your lawyers and doctors sending letters saying, I will die if I go to 135 pounds, if I try to go to 135, I mean, it's pretty obvious that she, that she doesn't want to fight Ronda. Ronda's the champ. And, and let's be honest here, guys. She... She just tested positive for steroids. She was stripped of her title, and you know, she holds no cards. She, she, she either wants to come in and she wants to face Ronda or she wants to stay at 145 and we can make some alternatives. Ronda's gonna fight and see if she can beat Liz. If she can beat Liz, then she'll defend her belt. There's a couple other really good fighters out there for her to fight. And, th huh? <laughs> and then, uh, and, and then, possible fight with, with Cyborg. Cyborg wants nothing to do with it. Believe me when I tell you. I, I tell you the truth. I told you we couldn't come to terms with Fedor because of his, his manager. They overplayed their, their, their hand. And uh, but Cyborg wants nothing to do with it. Hi, John. Uh, you stated before that uh, Frankie had a number of times in the pilot, so uh, the three girls Well, you know, nor normally for me, pound for pound guys should be the champions or some of the best in the world. Frankie's definitely in there, man. The fact that the guy held the title at 155 pounds, beat legends, you know, almost beat Ben Henderson. People would argue over who won that fight and who lost that fight. It it it's hard not to rank him as one of the pound for pound best and one of the toughest dudes I've ever met in my life, without a doubt.
Why do you make the outrageous story of Light Meeting Murray? So you find me as the whole life story. Lee Murray. What's that? Lee Murray's life story. Lee Murray's life story? Lee Murray, yeah. Uh, somebody bought it, I think. I think somebody bought Lee Murray's life story. Life isn't too good for Lee Murray right now. <laughs> but it's, it's a crazy story. Um, they did a big thing in the United States on ESPN about it. Sorry, I know I asked a question, but it just popped into my head. If you could step into the cage in any weight class and fight anybody ever in history, who would you like to fight? Let me tell you what, brother. I just got done with the surgery. I'm up here sweating like a... <laughs> <laughs> but if you got, sweating if you got like, like a... Like one, a, a if, you, if you got to fight one person. I'm about to purge myself up here or something. I, uh, I don't want to fight anybody. I, I, I'm going to fight to walk and get back into the car when this thing is over. As far as fighting, I, believe me when I tell you, if I could punch one guy in the head one time, I'd probably be Frank Shamrock. <laughs> He doesn't fight back. <laughs> Congratulations on your work, Marcel. Thank you, I appreciate it. And just over the years that you've been president of the UFC, you've had difficulties with certain fighters over the years, Tino, Ronnie Chornell. Is there any one fighter that you've dealt with that you regret getting in business with from the start? That I regret doing business with? Um, no. No, I wouldn't say that there's any guys that I actually regret doing business with. You know, I, I would probably have to say there was never a worse time in my life than when me and Tito, I mean, that dude drove me nuts, <laughs> nuts. Uh, and we used to battle, but uh, I, I don't regret it. Imagine if Tito was never in the UFC, you know, that would have sucked. And I don't ever do that. I don't keep guys out of the UFC because I don't like them. You, we don't have to get along to do business together. You can be in the UFC and we can do business together without me liking you. You can just deal with Lorenzo. How do you um, Hi. Do you think there's any performance uh, growth use in the UFC? And if so, how do you think you see it? Is there any performance enhancing drugs in the UFC? There's absolutely no performance enhancing drugs in the UFC. <laughs> <laughs> it's, all, it's always going to be a battle, you know. Uh, even with stuff that's legal now, like this testosterone replacement therapy that they're letting guys use. Now guys are starting to abuse that. Using too much TRT leading up to the fight, their levels are through the roof, and, and it's basically just like using the same thing. It's always gonna be a problem, and it's something that we're really cracking down on, and something that we're, uh, we're really uh, taking serious. Because the problem, the biggest problem with, with uh, performance enhancing drugs is that once you start using them, you can't get off them. It destroys you physically, mentally, emotionally, and every other way. So when you take a guy who's a talented, great fighter, and he destroys his body and his mind and everything else with that junk, it ruins a perfectly good athlete. So we're trying to, we're trying to catch guys before they start doing it. How are you going to do that? Well, Tan, first of all, every guy that comes into the Ultimate Fighter is tested for everything. And obviously, you're locked up in a house with cameras everywhere. Nobody's using anything on the Ultimate Fighter. And if you can start there and you can keep guys, you know, Educated, keep testing, and uh, you know, basically, just I, I think the biggest key is education. Educating these guys on why and how, and hopefully, you can do it. But people are always going to cheat, man. It's always going to happen. Kind of money they're making. Yeah. Right. Completely different business model than, than what we do. We have a whole infrastructure. We're actually building and growing a sport and a brand. Um, and everybody lives inside this league. Boxing is so fragmented. Think about this in the history of the world, there has never been a business or a brand that has generated billions of dollars. Yet at the end of the day, they have nothing. There's nothing there. We have a complete infrastructure in Las Vegas. Um, you know, we, we have 500 and something employees who work all over the world. Vegas, Toronto, London, China, um, and now opening an office in Brazil. 
and opening an office down in Australia. So this is, this is actually a real company and we're building and growing the sport and we spend millions of dollars a year. I mean, look at the money that's been spent on New York. Um, we're working on France. The money that's spent over here in the UK and Europe to build the sport. Completely different model. We're building a sport. Boxing is a sport that's, you know, you got to, 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 to run a boxing promotion, you need a secretary and a fax machine and you go out and you put fights together. It's just a completely different business model. And that's why boxing is in so much trouble. <coughs> We're doing the exact opposite of what these guys did. Hey, Dan, how are you doing? Good, uh, buddy. Firstly, congratulations on your award. Thank you. Uh, secondly, and more importantly, congratulations on signing Conor McGregor for the UFC. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank my you. question is uh, kind of a fight reverse and a finance situation. So in recent times, it's not necessarily the number one competitor that has been getting uh, time to <coughs> For example, uh, Diaz versus GSP, and also I guess Chael Sonnen coming in at uh, like heavyweight to uh, fight uh, John Jones. How important do you feel in the future that the rankings will uh, play into that, the official rankings, or will it still always be a situation where you feel that whatever's going to make the most amount of money, as opposed to who deserves that shot? Yeah, there's no doubt. The, the ranking systems are voted on by the media, but at the end of the day, my job, what I believe my job is, is to put on the fights that you guys want to see. So if number one fights number five, and that's the fight people want to see, then that's the fight that's going to happen. Does people not feel like, so for example, Johnny Hendricks, does he not feel very aggrieved or? Yeah, but we're doing, here's the thing. And you guys disagree if you, I mean, you know, you disagree with me if you think that I'm wrong, but George St. Pierre's been a great champion. He's fought everybody we've ever asked him to fight. He's cleaned out the division. You know, there's new guys coming up now. <coughs> He wanted to fight Diaz. He said, I want this Diaz fight. This guy said tons of things about me. Um, he disrespected me and, 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 and you know, th there was more that went down that people don't realize about Diaz and GSP. Um, Diaz was yelling stuff at him at the hotel, was chasing him around the hotel one day. <laughs> he all kinds of crazy stuff. He said all that stuff about him on TV and George was like, this is the dude I want to fight. I want to fight this guy. And the way that we did it is we ended up making it a tournament. I mean, all the six of the best guys in the world are fighting on that card. Whoever wins, then we'll fight next. Johnny Hendricks will get a shot. Yeah, it's going to be a good card, I'm going to say, yeah. It really is. I'm excited for that one. We are, myself and my girlfriend, we're heading to USC 159 over in New Jersey, so looking forward to that. Very excited. 